He was a very gifted scholar, a government official, a national hero, and this is a very strange one, but he became a celebrity during the time that he studied abroad in Japan. But most importantly, he became a beacon signal for missions in Korea. Let's remember Lee Su Jong. Well, Lee Su Jong became a believer in 1883, but he died three years later in 1886. In that short period of three years, he laid the framework for missions in Joseon. And this is very important. He basically prepared the way for missionaries to come into Joseon officially. He wrote a very, very crucial, important letter to the American churches. And this became the starting domino for the sending of missionaries to Korea. So let's cover his background a little bit. Our story begins in 1842. Lee Su-jung was born in Gokseong-gun. I've never heard of this place. Gokseong-gun in the South Jeolla province, which is located in modern-day South Korea. And he was trained in Confucian teachings, which was customary at the time, and he rose to excellence. He was eventually, at a very young age, he was given an official position to serve the government. And here's a difference from the previous people we've talked about, like So Sang Yun and Pe Kong Jun. Um, Lee Su Jung was from the nobility, and he wasn't from the north. I'm sure you guys are tired of hearing about Uju. We heard about Uju so many times, but Lee Su Jung was from the southern part of the Korean peninsula, and he was of nobility. He was a yangban, which is the Korean word uh, to the Korean word for high official, high, higher class, upper class. He was upper class, he was bougie, and he was a scholar. Okay, that's the main difference that we have here. The Joseon government at the time was divided. So he joined the government at a very, very turbulent and rocky time. There was fighting, infighting between an isolationist faction and a reformist faction. So the isolationists, like the name might suggest, they wanted to keep the country isolated. They wanted to keep Joseon closed off from foreign powers. They only wanted to talk to Japan and, and China like they have for, for centuries. The reformists, they knew that you know there was all this technology and there was a lot of benefit that came with opening the doors to foreign powers. And so they wanted to open the doors to Western powers so that they can compete with China and Japan because China and Japan, they already had, um, like, they already had guns. Chosan was still using arrows, like flaming arrows and cannons. Um, maybe uh, muskets, you know, where you had to actually um, take a little ball and, and shove it into the barrel and shoot it. No, like, that's like, no, that was uh, way behind the uh, surrounding neighbors at the time. So the reformists wanted to open up. So isolationists, reformists, they were fighting. But before I tell you which side Lee Su-jung was on, because he did have to choose a side, um, which side would you have been on? Which side would I have been on? I, I think I would have been... That's really hard, isn't it? <laughs> it's really hard to say. I think I would have been more leaning towards the reformist side because, you know, our country needed guns. And, and Chuseon was constantly being, that there were little skirmishes here and there with different countries. And each time, you know, it was just a catastrophe. And that should have been like a warning signal. Hey, at least upgrade the military. You know, keep the country safe. Maybe we can keep our values, but keep the country safe. That's, that's just my 10 cents in it. But Lee Su Jung, okay, Lee Su Jung was affiliated with the reformist faction. Okay, the reformist faction was under Queen Min, or they call her Empress Min, but she was the wife of Emperor Ko Jong, who was the second to last emperor uh, and ruler of Joseon. So the two factions would fight and sometimes the reformists would win some and the isolationists would win some and there was like a seesaw going back and forth. So one of the things that the reformists were able to pass was a military reform. And it sounds great, right? This is something that I would have wanted too if I had lived back then. Um, but they, well, what happened was Japanese soldiers would be brought in, hired to train a modernized division of soldiers with modernized weapons, modernized uniforms, the whole nine yards. It is a small battalion, right? So the modern division received better treatment, better food, better uh, equipment than the traditional soldiers. Now, the traditional soldiers are the majority, right? Because the modern division is only a small division. Um, after several, you know, unequal treatment and a lot of different incidents, the, you know, the morale of the traditional soldiers was, was basically dropped. 
Okay, and, and they, they couldn't stand it anymore. And it's understandable. They had served the country just, just like the modern division did, but the modern division was receiving better treatment. So long story short, the, right, the traditional soldiers staged a rebellion in 1882. And they were joined by massive mobs, massive anti-Western, anti-Queen Min mobs. And they stormed the palace. This is a very famous rebellion in 1882, and it's called the Imo Kunlan, Imo Rebellion. And like, if you want to remember it, you don't really have to. It's like, Imo. The key leaders of this reform, the reformist faction, were assassinated. And these were mostly Queen Min's relatives and her supporters. And so the rebels were searching and storming the palace. They were looking for the queen as well. They were going to kill her too. And this is where Lee Su-jung comes in. So I mentioned before that Lee Su-jung was a national hero. Now this is when it happened. So all the rebels and uh, the rebels, the people that had stormed the palace, they were looking for the queen. And they almost had her. But Lee Su-jung came back into the palace. All the other officials had run away, you know, to save their lives. Uh, but Lee Su-jung, you know, he was also in danger too because he's one of the reformist faction. But he uh, disguised himself as one of the palace guards and he sneaked in to rescue the queen. And this is how it happened. He had to roll her up into this blanket. And he, he basically uh, hitched her onto this little, um, I'll show you a picture. It's going to be somewhere on the screen here. But this little wooden thing where you can stack things onto. Yeah, you'll probably see it right now. I posted it probably up here. But he basically hitched her onto that. Okay, and he sneaked out of the palace just in time. Um, and the rebel, rebels couldn't find her. And he had to, he ran on foot carrying the queen on on his back hitched on his back and he like traveled I, I don't know how many miles but he traveled to a a distant city where the emperor was able to pick up the queen and everyone was safe so once the rebel rebellion blah once the re rebellion was brought down <laughs> that's i don't i didn't know rebellion could be such a hard word to say um the king publicly recognized Lee Su jong for his bravery and he said he would grant him any wish. And we'll find out next time what he wished for. Thanks for joining in this episode. And I'm going to try, I promise, to try to write more regularly uh, post material. Thank you very much.